continue in this uh, particular Mr. Chairman, will you direct the witness to answer that question? You have only one answer the question. And that is the cost price in the industry? Your excuse. Chaos in the industry. Will you direct the witness to answer that question, Mr. Chairman? I told you before I will answer this question now, fully. Now, Mr. Your purpose is to use this to disrupt the motion picture industry. Now, to invade Beaman. the right not only of me, but of the producers to their thoughts, to their opinions. This is a hearing room in Washington, D.C., where a congressional committee is investigating subversive acts in America. Officially named the House Committee on Un-American Activities, it has also been called the American Inquisition. What my religious beliefs are... Stand away from the stand! The effect of its hearings can still be felt to this day. In 1947, two years after the victory over Nazi Germany, the United States was at war with itself, persecuting its own citizens in the name of anti-communism. It soon became a crusade that would reach its climax in the early 1950s with Senator Joseph McCarthy's televised hearings, in which State Department officials and even officers of the army were recklessly charged with disloyalty. But before national television, it was an earlier Un-American Activities Committee, which had investigated teachers and doctors and labor leaders, Americans from all walks of life. In 1947, that committee turned its spotlight on Hollywood, questioning members of the motion picture industry about their politics and their patriotism. A defiant group of ten men, writers, directors, and producers, refused to cooperate. They challenged the committee's right to probe their personal beliefs. They became known as the Hollywood Ten. In the years that followed, a tidal wave of blacklisting swept through Hollywood, affecting hundreds of lives. This is a story about those years and some of the families that share the legacy of the Hollywood blacklist. I am Sadie Ornitz, the wife of Samuel Ornitz, one of the Hollywood Ten. I am speaking from memory, facing my 93rd birthday and I look back on the years since and remember especially my husband's devotion to justice and high ethics. Are you a member of the Screenwriters Guild? I wish to reply to that question by saying that this involves a serious question of conscience for me. Conscience? You, conscience, sir. Conscience. I say you do raise a serious question of conscience for me when you ask me to act in concert with you to override the Constitution. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Go ahead. Wait, 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 wait a minute, let me answer the question. Just, just a minute. minute. You're question. asking me ask to me. violate the constitutional the guarantee just a minute. of violate the Constitution. It does. Answer question. The witness is through. Stand away. I wish to repeat this again. Stand away. Conscience can be a hard taskmaster, exact a heavy price. The Hollywood Ten and many who later followed them before the committee would pay that price in lost careers and shattered lives. Today, many of those brought before the committee have died, but their stories continue on in their families and their shared commitment to a lifetime of political ideals and to the service of a conscience that still endures. Uh, Mr. Scott, uh, uh, could you tell the committee whether or not you are now or have ever been a member of the Communist Party? Mr. Stripling, that question is designed to inquire into my personal and private life. I don't think it is pertinent to this... Uh, I don't think it's a proper question either. Do you At that time, Adrian Scott was a very big figure in my eyes, a, a celebrity. He was considered one of the really bright, successful young stars of Hollywood. And when he made Crossfire, the first feature film on anti-Semitism in 1947, he represented everything that was important to me. And in the years that we went together, I never stopped viewing him as 
a hero. Are you trying to answer the question, Mr. Cuff? I believe that question also invades my right as a citizen. I believe it also invades the First Amendment. I believe that I should not engage in any conspiracy with you to invade the First Amendment. In 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC as it was called, began its investigation of communism in the motion picture industry. The committee, including Chairman J. Parnell Thomas and the young congressman from California, Richard M. Nixon, gained instant publicity for itself by calling up celebrities to testify and capitalizing on the public's never-ending fascination with Hollywood. First to be called before HUAC were well-known film stars, men like Robert Taylor, Ronald Reagan, Robert Montgomery, men who would not only bring widespread publicity to the hearings, but would answer the committee's questions in a friendly manner. Do you believe, as a prominent person in, in your field, that uh, it would be wise for us to, for the Congress to pass legislation to outlaw the Communist Party in the United States? I think it would be a good idea, although I don't know, I have never read uh, Karl Marx and I don't know the basis of communism beyond what I've uh, picked up from hearsay. What I've heard, I don't like it because it isn't on the level. If I had my way about it, they'd all be sent back to Russia or some other unpleasant place. I would, I would move to the state of Texas if it ever came here because I think the Texans would kill them on sight. <laughs> Many studio moguls fearing a financial loss were also eager to cooperate with the committee. But the most damaging testimony was the actual naming of names. Do you recall the names of any of the actors in the guild who participate in such activities? Well, the one chap I'm thinking of currently is uh, Mr. Howard De Silva. Always seems to have something to say at the wrong time. Ms. Karen Morley also usually appears at the... Guild meetings. K-A-R-E-N-M-O-R. I believe so, yes, yes. After the big stars and the studio bosses made their appearance, a group of lesser-known characters took center stage. Seven writers, two directors, and one producer were called before HUAC. They were to be questioned about membership in the Communist Party, a party which, by the way, had always been legal in the United States. The men agreed to close ranks and challenge the committee's right to invade their constitutional guarantees of freedom of belief and freedom of expression. These were the Hollywood Ten. Mr. Moss, are you a member of the Communist Party? Next, you are going to ask what my religious beliefs are, and you are going to insist before various members of the industry that since you don't like my religious beliefs, I should not work in that industry. In that period, being a communist was, was uh, talked about in the same breath as being a murderer. And I think that that attitude prevails today with uh, millions of people in this country who uh, communists to them was, was a, a horrible creature. They had no notion of, of what a communist was or what communism stood for. I was involved, and my husband was involved, in the progressive movement since the 1930s. During the Depression, I lived in the Bronx, and life was a terrible struggle, and I wasn't the only one. America was falling apart. Banks were closing, and people were starving, and there were men riding the rails in America, going from, from city to city looking for a job. The whole country was in ferment. They were angry, they were unemployed, and there was a lot of political activity that made a lot of sense. And that was my introduction to the progressive movement. And from then on, I was hooked. I was a child of the Depression, and 
knew what it was to be on the bottom without much chance for education uh, or any kind of comfortable life. And I remember at age 17 reading George Bernard Shaw's Intelligent Woman's Guide to Socialism, which sort of put me out. Um, from that point on, I became a person who was very committed to political ideals, which for me meant um, the grace of wrath concept that you couldn't beat up people because they wanted to organize farm labors. You couldn't shoot people for being strike leaders. You had to give people a chance to earn a living, which you didn't have during the Depression. And that's all people wanted was a chance, the dignity of work. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. I became educated in the progressive movement. I discovered my talents, which I had no notion that I had any. And I discovered, to my great surprise, that I was a pretty good organizer. And that's how I spent it the next 20 years, raising money for the new masses, the National Guardian, putting on concerts, plays. I kept working in the progressive movement constantly. I never stopped for a day. We all had a dream. We had a dream of a better world for everybody. It was a heyday, I would say, of good feeling about one's country, one's beliefs, and acting on those beliefs. That made you feel alive, and it made you feel that uh, you were working for, for a, a better world. And what was more important than that? And I think we felt that we could accomplish a lot more than we actually were able to. Uh, but that didn't keep us from trying. And it doesn't, uh, none of us have really given up basically our point of view that the, that the world is, uh, is more perfectible than it is. Each one of us, from being provincial, became internationally oriented. And our minds grew, our souls grew, we became much much greater human beings in our interest in the international getting together of all people. In support of the Spanish loyalists from the heart of America, the people responded. I had formed the Hollywood Women's Council as a result of my work with the League for Peace and Democracy. I recall that there had been a collection of letters, stacks and stacks of them, in support, in support of loyalist Spain. Will Rogers, Jr. was on the platform at the Shrine Auditorium when we were waiting to send these letters. Will Rogers, Jr. said, the war has been lost. And the shock was like some kind of tremendous personal loss. Only a few short years after the Spanish Civil War, 
the fight against fascism erupted into World War II. All America pulled together in the war effort, including Hollywood, which turned out a stream of patriotic films, many written by men who would later be called un-American. During World War II, the United States was allied with the Soviet Union, and the U.S. government praised the virtues of our Soviet ally. Here in the village of Western Russia, behind the German lines of six months ago, the Russian people were burning their own farms. It is not only the Red Army that crushed the Germans on the Eastern Front. It's the courage of the Russian people. In the final days of World War II, our coalition with the Soviet Union ended, and a cold war of suspicion and mistrust began. At home, Americans dreamed of a new era of peace and prosperity. But all too soon, old disputes put aside during the war resurfaced. Even Hollywood was beset by problems as writers and studio technicians struggled to organize labor unions. Some politicians intent on crushing labor militancy and dismantling the New Deal used the Cold War and anti-communism as their springboard to power. The communists have been, still are, and always will be a menace to freedom, to democratic ideals, to the worship of God, and to America's way of life. This committee, under its mandate from the House of Representatives, has the responsibility of exposing and spotlighting subversive elements wherever they may exist. It is only to be expected that communists would strive desperately to gain entry to the motion picture industry, simply because the industry offers such a tremendous weapon for education and propaganda. I think it was important to silence the, the uh, the communications business, there was nothing subversive in the content of the pictures. But they wanted to set the stage for the Cold War, and they really wanted to frighten the American people, and they did a masterful job in that direction. Hollywood fights back! Judy Garland, have you been to a movie this week? You're going to a movie tonight, or maybe tomorrow? Look around the room. Are there any newspapers lying on the floor? Any magazines on your table? Any books on your shelves? It's always been your right to read or see anything you wanted to. But now it seems to be getting kind of complicated. When the hearings took place in Washington, uh, D.C., there was a groundswell of support in the Hollywood community for the 10. And a number of celebrities banded into a group called the Committee for the First Amendment. And some of these people were Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Danny Kaye, Katherine Hepburn, Moss Hart. And these people went on a chartered flight to Washington to demonstrate support for the Hollywood 10. And I think in the context of the times, it was especially moving because it took courage to stand up at that time and risk identification with the Hollywood 10. Well, I got involved with this whole blacklist thing when Anatole Litvak called me up. He was a very well-known um, director who I knew professionally. And he asked me to go to a meeting at um, Ira Gershwin's house to discuss the situation in Washington that was going on. I felt very strongly, being an American, that America had really been founded by people who'd come over here because they wanted freedom of speech and freedom of thought. And so I was very, very enthusiastic about it. And I said yes, that I would go. Well, when we went to Washington, they brought us in all together into the committee room. And J. Parnell Thomas, who went to jail, as you know later, uh, and he, he brought in John Howard Lawson to, to speak. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? The question of communism is in no way related to this inquiry, which is an attempt to get control of the screen and to invade the basic uh, rights of American Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. in all fields. And citizens, whether they be Protestant or Methodist or Jewish... John Howard Lawson was going to not answer, and Parnell Thomas knew it, so he started 
banging that gavel. And louder and louder and louder. And he, you could, could not hear Lawson speaking. You just couldn't hear. We're going to get the answer to that question we have to say every week. For the Bill of Rights, we want that to be I was chilled by this. I was absolutely chilled. I was in the chamber of my government. And they were drowning out of speech. It was frightening. I'll never forget as long as I live. This is Humphrey Bogart. We sat in the committee room and heard it happen. We saw it. We said to ourselves, it can happen here. We saw American citizens denied the right to speak by elected representatives of the people. We saw police take citizens from the stand like criminals after they'd been refused the right to defend themselves. We saw the gavel of a committee chairman cutting off the words of free Americans. The sound of that gavel, Mr. Thomas, rings across America. Because every time your gavel struck, it hit the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. All the motion picture people had gotten together, they could have stopped it, I think. Stopped the Washington investigation. They, they didn't. They were scared. I don't know why. Well, I suppose the studios were frightened because it, when they're frightened, it always means money. It isn't patriotism, I don't think. Uh, I think they were afraid that, uh, that if there was a writer who had any kind of communist leanings or if an actor was a communist, I'm afraid they, they felt that the, the uh, public would stay away. We will forthwith discharge or suspend without compensation those in our employ, and we will not re-employ any of the ten until such time as he is acquitted or has purged himself of contempt and declares under oath that he is not a communist. It wasn't long before the loyalty and patriotism of anyone who had shown support of the Ten was being called into question. At that time in my career, I was, as they say, on a sort of a roll. I seemed to be getting all the parts in my particular bracket. I just played opposite Gary Cooper and uh, Cary Grant, and I'd done a golden picture, all sorts of things. And then my agent called up one day, and he said, I do not understand what's happening. You were up for two pictures, one you had, but the studio called this morning and said they'd changed their mind. Then that happened again and again. And then I began to think, what is in this thing? And a friend of mine, who had nothing to do with this committee, called me up, and he said, Jane, I think you ought to know that you're on the list. I said, what list? He said, you're on the Red Channels list the blacklist. I said, oh, that's so silly. Well, I said, I'm not a communist. Everybody knows that. Then I couldn't get any jobs, so we just went to New York. Well, I think it put a sort of a stop on my film career. And I didn't come back till I did Father Knows Best. I hated it here. I hated the atmosphere. I hated people losing jobs around me. All the people I liked had gone to Europe. So I went over and joined them. While some did leave Hollywood, the ten could not. They were engaged in an uphill legal battle against the rising tide of anti-communist sentiment. In 1950, their final options ran out. All ten said goodbye to their families and left to serve one-year terms in the federal penitentiary. husband went to prison, I then devoted the rest of that year to talking to the community on all levels about the injustice, about the unfairness, and about the victims of hysteria. I believe that that probably kept me going. They made a film on behalf of the Hollywood Ten. And I recall that I spent my days with this film going to the community, going to trade unions, going to 
all kinds of organizations in behalf of their fight. The committee is now free to operate, to drag before it a thousand people, or the million it boasts it has on its list. How are you going to answer the committee's questions? Answer yes or no. Are you a member of the Communist Party, of the Progressive Party? Did you ever give a dollar to loyalist Spain? When we were asked, are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? The committee was really preparing to ask you, are you now or have you ever been in favor of peace? In Korea, the United States was now fully engaged in combat, no longer just a cold war. Korea would be the first of a continuing series of clashes with communist troops. In 1951, while the war raged on and the Ten were still in prison, HEWAC began a second wave of hearings, both in Washington, D.C. and Hollywood. Over a hundred people were called to testify. Like the Ten, many refused to cooperate with the committee. Among this group were agent George Wilner and screenwriter Michael Wilson. Ironically, Wilson's film, A Place in the Sun, had just become a hit at the box office and would win that year's Academy Award. When Mike was called to testify, my husband's father argued with Mike that Mike should go ahead and testify because if he didn't, it would break his mother's heart. And, would, and he, that all he had to do was get up there and say that he was... Uh, that he was, he was not a communist and that everything would be fine, he said. And he couldn't understand why Mike wanted to be an uncooperative witness and he never did understand why Mike was standing on principle, saying that they have no right to ask him questions about, about his politics. We came to uh, Hollywood in 1939 and he became a highly successful agent. And in 1950, he was called before the Un-American Activities Committee in Washington, and he refused to reveal who, who names or who his clients were or any of the other questions that were put to him by the committee. And he was therefore separated from his company. And uh, that was the beginning of the blacklist period for us. But some of those called to testify did cooperate with the committee talking about themselves and incriminating others. Writers like Martin Berkeley and Leo Townsend named literally hundreds of people. Edward G. Robinson uh, would fall in that category. Ten years ago or more, he started uh, joining one communist front after another. We knew in advance, in many cases, who was going to be called because it was pretty widely publicized. And normally, the stool pigeons would always make it a point of going to their best friends, the ones that they were going to inform on, and, and practically asking their permission and telling them in advance what they were going to do. I remember the John Best Passes, received John Best Passes, one of our best American writers, John, J-O-H-N. It was devastating for people to, among friends, to, uh, to feel that someone that you'd been close to, that you'd cared for, loved became an informer. It was, it was almost unendurable. There were some people who took it better than others. Mike took it very, very hard when people that he had been very, very close to informed on him. He felt personally betrayed, and he felt that he, would, uh, that he could never ha ever have any contact with these people. And furthermore, this attitude of his remained throughout his uh, entire life. He never really warmed up to the informers. Actor Larry Parks, well known for supporting liberal causes, was called to testify in 1951. In an effort to avoid jail and save his career, he named names in a closed door session with disastrous results. Don't present me with the choice of either being in contempt of this committee and going to jail or forcing me to crawl through the mud to be an informer. I, I beg you not to force me to do this. It was a, a very difficult thing. Larry had made the decision, you see, to do what pleased nobody. It didn't please the committee, and it didn't please the people who had decided that the best thing to do was to take the fifth, because he, he went, he did neither. 
he said yes I was and they had a private committee meeting in which uh, they settled for saying you know do you know this person do you know that person and what it did was it it made it very hard for him because for a long time a lot of people who had been his friends and whom he was whom we loved um, were upset at his position I know that um, I would run into people every once in a while <clears throat> and it was interesting uh, I'd come home and I'd say well, you know, guess who I saw at the market so and so and Larry would always say were they pleasant and I would just break my heart <laughs> terrible I don't know I don't sort of feel that I would have named names but then you really do put your life and your family's life in jeopardy. Uh, it was very difficult. I think it's very difficult to remember what those times were and how, how um, threatening it all was. I know people did name names. I know Lillian Hellman didn't. But I can't criticize the people that they, who did. I really can't. They may have done it from a patriotic point of view. They may have done it to save their own skin. Or just being plain pragmatic. There are some who said that the all the people involved in the McCarthy period were all victims. But I don't agree with that. There are victims, they're all victims, I think, in a deep uh, philosophical sense. But certainly the informers had a choice to make, and it was a moral choice, and they chose. We all chose. So it's hard to forgive them. Somebody asked me once, he says, uh, would you forgive or forget? I says, well, I could perhaps in, in, the, in the extremities I can forgive, but I can never forget. Soon, hundreds of people found their names appearing on lists as indiscriminate blacklisting became a full-time pursuit of self-appointed witch hunters and fanatics. Are you a member of the Congress Party? Or have you ever been a Having completed its work, the Un-American Activities Committee left Hollywood in 1952 leaving in its wake over 300 people condemned by blacklisting and unable to work in the motion picture industry. It was, you know, after the circus has left town and you have to get on with your life and nobody really cares now. And he struggled just to make a living, just to try to get out of debt. And he tried everything from office work to writing for comic strips and couldn't manage any of them. Sam came home and thought he would write. And all he could do was just sit and think. George was blacklisted for 13 years, the most productive years of his life and also the time when he could have made a fortune. He got a job for $75 a week selling cheesecloth for some company in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, he made many attempts to get back into the agency business without success. It's hard, it's hard to conjecture what Mike would have written and what he had not had written had he not been blacklisted. And. Uh, in spite of being blacklisted, you could say, he wrote some extraordinary films. When the men went to prison, it had already been established that there would be a blacklist in Hollywood, that these people would never work again. And after they came out of prison, they began to realize that those of them who were writers could function under someone else's name. Um, 
the front concept of someone else taking the script in, sitting in conferences and so forth. So uh, George was the man, as an agent, he had the, the uh, wherewithal to take the scripts that were submitted to him and attempt to sell them to the studios. He became known as the man who operated the front. And we knew from 1947 to 1950 that it, it was only a matter of time before they would go after him because what he was doing was enabling blacklisted writers to live. Mike uh, did black market writing. And the way it was set up with one of his friends is that he would deliver the completed pages to the drugstore. And the pharmacist would, uh, in a brown paper bag, the pharmacist would take the brown paper bag in the back where he mixed up his medicine. And he'd take the screenplay out and put in money and then hand it back to Mike and Mike would bring it home, and it had enough money, which we would live on for the next few weeks. Perhaps the best known of the blacklisted writers was Dalton Trumbo, Academy Award nominee for Kitty Foyle, and author of the widely acclaimed anti-war novel, Johnny Got His Gun. A flamboyant, charismatic character, Trumbo was also a deeply dedicated family man. He shunned the glamour of Hollywood, preferring instead to spend time in the idyllic setting of his mountain ranch. During the blacklist years, Trumbo wrote under a variety of pseudonyms. In 1955, Trumbo's screenplay for The Brave One, written under the assumed name of Robert Rich, won an Academy Award, causing great confusion when no one showed up to claim the Oscar. One of the things that Chris and uh, my sister and I developed uh, early on in the, during the blacklist was the ability to keep secrets, because there were so many. Among uh, the secrets that we had to keep were all of uh, Trumpo's pseudonyms. We just learned that if the telephone rang and uh, we answered it, and if it was for uh, Mr. Jackson or uh, Mr. Smith or Mr. whoever it was, we knew to say, just hold on just a minute, he's here someplace, or I'll see if I can find him, because uh, it couldn't have been a wrong number, not with all the pseudonyms floating around our house. It had to, that, it had to be Trumpo they were calling for. Robert Rich, Sam Jackson, Elizabeth B. Weston, John Abbott, Peter Flint, Theodore Flaxman, Beth Cleo Fincher, Orville McElliott, Millard Pillory. They were all Dalton Trumbo. Barred from working in the studios, a small group of blacklisted Hollywood artists responded by forming their own production company and making an independent film, Salt of the Earth. Have you learned nothing from this strike? Why are you afraid to have me at your side? Do you still think you can have dignity only by having none? Stock up, Nathan. Mike was shooting uh, Salt of the Earth in New Mexico at the time, and they were being uh, uh, harassed every day by the, by the police, by the, some of the townspeople, vigilantes, by the immigration authorities. And uh, I was working at a firm, a very large firm in the Los Angeles area. And uh, I was the color consultant. Meanwhile, this harassment on Salt of the Earth, and it hits Time magazine, and, uh, and there's a big article, Mike's pictures in the paper, and suddenly I get a call from the front office, the administrative people, and they call me into the front office, and they say, and they fire me on the spot. And the reason uh, given that they fired me is because there was a big gymnasium in Santa Monica High School, and I had painted it blue, and they didn't like the color blue. It was the wrong color blue, and why did I paint it that color? But everyone knew that it was for political reasons. They asked me to leave, and with two hours, within two hours, they asked me to get out of the uh, drafting room. In 1952, uh, a new writers' union was formed called the Television Writers of America. And I was approached to be the executive director of the union. And it was wonderfully exciting for me. But within about a year and a half, it became clear that the reactionary elements in the other unions were not going to just sit back and be defeated by this upstart young union. And I was told that someone in the more reactionary element in Hollywood was arranging for me to be subpoenaed before the House Committee in a quite obvious attempt to split 
and destroy the union. My appearance before the committee, where I took the first and the fifth, did have the effect of splitting the union right down the middle and destroying it. Uh, I was only 34, but having just arrived at a job where I could function as a, as a human being, not just a, a machine to type or take shorthand, uh, the ground was cut out from under me. I had nowhere to go. I was a name that was now branded. It was very difficult to be a kid growing up during the blacklist. Um, my sister, who's not here today, and Chris and I were subjected to all kinds of harassment as kids. We were blackballed from clubs. Chris was thrown into a, a, attempted to be thrown into a furnace when he started junior high school by a couple of kids. Uh, Mitzi went through a terrible hazing, which resulted in her having to leave the school that she was in. And you don't forget those kinds of experiences when they happen to you. It soon became apparent that those who were blacklisted were no longer welcome in America. Some went abroad to England, France, and other countries where employment still was sometimes possible. My father was called before HUAC in 51 and in 1956, when I was about eight years old, we moved to France. The whole family moved there. And well, when we were in France, in Paris, there was a whole community of other blacklisted people or people who were either chosen or had been forced into exile for economic reasons because they'd been blacklisted. Uh, we, on Sundays, we used to have these parties. It was a fairly tight-knit group of people. We would have... Uh, picnics and gatherings on Sundays. Uh, we'd play softball. We were considered celebrities, not refugees. We were considered people to be honored and made much of. So for us, it was very much like leaving um, a police state and going to a free country. There just wasn't a fuss made about communists or communism and that they were heads of unions, they were teachers, they were members of government, and they were accepted like any other party, any other political group. But I do remember that when we were living in France, there was, uh, in, there was a lot of unhappiness in our household, and I think a lot of that did have to do with the blacklist. Basically, you know, I had the feeling that we were running. We had run from something to there, and we were waiting to find out what was going to happen. It was also in this period that I started to uh, sense a feeling of alienation, that I didn't belong somehow to the, uh, the society at large. I didn't feel that there was truly a place that I felt comfortable outside of my family. It was an odd feeling sometimes growing up. Uh, teenagers, they're like to brag about themselves. Whatever they can manage to brag about, they'll try to brag about. Now, I wanted to brag about my famous father who had written Lawrence of Arabia and Bridge on the River Kwai, but I was in this odd position of wondering if people would really believe me because when I went and saw the movies, his name wasn't on the screen. I was very proud of my father and proud of the in integrity and the courage that he'd shown in refusing to answer the committee's questions. But it was very hard. My father felt terrible that he didn't get the recognition that he deserved. And uh, I remember when we first uh, moved to France and uh, Brisbane River Kwai first came out, was first shown in the theaters in France, uh, going, to, going out with my parents to the movies to see that and my sister and the whole family sitting there watching it in a movie theater and the credits come up and I look over at my father and when it says uh, screenplay based on the novel by Pierre Boulle that has no credit for screenwriter looking over at my father and seeing tears streaming down his face well I think the uh, that European intellectuals in general were really shocked to see uh, intellectuals and artists challenged on a political basis because they regard this as the very last stage of the fascism, you know, when fascism is about to take over a country, that's when you tell your intellectuals and your men of letters and your w women of letters to shut up. Back in America, 
J. Parnell Thomas had gone to prison for tax evasion. And Joseph McCarthy was the new champion of anti-communism. In Hollywood, a marked change had taken place in the content of motion pictures. I think that through the work of the House on American Activities Committee, the American people were deprived of a whole generation of screen creativity. And concepts that are profoundly American, uh, love of peace and love of equality, and respect for all peoples of all colors, uh, were uh, challenged uh, as if they were uh, fundamentally un-American. In the 60s, things began to change. Amidst the climate of protest and social upheaval, the blacklist began to loosen its grip on Hollywood. In 1962, Donald Trumbo received screen credit for writing both Spartacus and Exodus. Slowly, other blacklisted artists were able to work again. But for many, it was too late. When we came back to Hollywood, of course, it was a whole new ball game. Adrian was hired by Universal Studios under a two-year contract. He was ordered around by men young enough to be his son. He was really pushed around. He was not given the kind of authority and creative ability that presumably they brought him back for. He started to withdraw about a year after we came back and became deeply depressed and then finally was diagnosed as having cancer and died in three months. And I'm convinced that his emotional state his despair, his disappointment, after coming so close, after so long a struggle, was such a stress that he just decided to stop living. George finally did come back when he was 60 years old, and he made a comeback bigger than he had before. And he met young people in the industry who, when they were introduced to them, they said, oh, George Willer, we, we thought you were dead. My father used to talk about you. And then he quit of his own accord after he'd been in the business again for six years when the banks took over the industry and he felt he could no longer function in, in, the, in the chaotic state that the motion picture found itself in. And it was the smartest thing he had ever done. We had a, a wonderful life. Our marriage from the very beginning was very solid because uh, we were friends and we thought alike and we worked together well. So we had gone through the depression and we'd gone through poverty and now we were going through the blacklist and all that was nothing because we were there to fight it as a unit. And uh, you can't, that can't be beaten. We were never beaten by outside forces. And it certainly never could divide us. When I look down the years and see how this aspiration, mutually shared by man and woman, creates a loyalty, dedication of the long years of marriage. Mine was severed by death. 42 years. Finally, realized that I must go to law. I have done that for 26 years now.
but I don't consider my life a, uh, a tragedy as a result of, uh, of, of my husband being blacklisted or because of the blacklisted period. I think I've gone being an architect. I've had a lot of wonderful things happen to me, one of which was to go to Europe. It's a marvelous opportunity to go to Europe and look at the architecture of Europe and be a part of that, be part of the, of the European scene, which enriched me as a human being and enriched me as an architect. Oh. I had an opportunity that maybe I wouldn't have had. I don't say I'm lucky that I was that Mike was Lexus. I'm just saying is that that there are fortuitous things that happen within a lifetime that come out of they come out of a, a difficult situation or a situation that could have been tragic. And one of them was the fact that that the that this experience enriched my life. No, I don't think I would have done anything differently. I, these, but certain things are important in one's life and. Uh, that's the way I live my life, by, by the It was a question of integrity and, uh, and what, what is important and what isn't important in one's life. I would say it was a body blow that one never recovered from. I never expect to recover from it. I will live with it. I will deal with it more or less successfully at a given time, but I don't think I'll ever recover from that blow. And for that very reason, for what it's done to me, for what it did to Adrian, I'll never forgive informers either. how we survive it. But I think what happens is that your courage is so high that you can take that in stride and almost accept it as part of the inevitable sacrifice that you have to make for what you believe in. In 1975, shortly before he died, Dalton Trumbo was finally given the Oscar for the Brave One, an honor that had been denied him since 1956. In 1985, long after the death of Michael Wilson, the Motion Picture Academy held a ceremony in his honor. Would Mrs. Zelma Wilson and her daughters, Becca and Rosanna, please join me? The Academy is proud to present to you this award to Carl Foreman and Michael Wilson for best screenplay based on material from another medium, The Bridge of the River Fly. Thank you. As long as. Long as. Mike got the uh, Laurel Award in 1976. In his response, when he got the Laurel Award, he, uh, the last two paragraphs of his statement were so great that I want to read them to you. Just take a minute. He said, I don't want to dwell on the past, but for a few moments to speak of the future. And I address my remaining remarks, particularly to you, younger men and women who had perhaps not yet established yourselves in this industry at the time of the great witch hunt. I feel that unless you remember this dark epoch and understand it, you may be doomed to replay it, not with the same cast of characters, of course, or on the same issues, but I see a day perhaps coming in your lifetime, if not in mine, when a new crisis of belief will grip this republic, when diversity of opinion will be labeled disloyalty, and when extraordinary pressures will be put on writers in the mass media to conform to administration policy on the key issues of the time, whatever they may be. If this gloomy scenario should come to pass, I trust that you, younger men and women, will shelter the maverick and dissenters in your ranks, 
and protect their right to work. The guild will have the use and the need of rebels if it is to survive as a union of free riders. This nation will have need of them if it is to survive as an open society. Today, the film industry is no longer the abject prisoner of national hysteria. For survivors, the years of the Hollywood Inquisition are a bitter and distant memory. And yet the struggle goes on. And so long as the struggle continues, it will need more men and women of conscience and goodwill. Citizens who, in the midst of battle, can keep a steady eye on the future. The one cry that must come from the heart Please, never let this happen again. Coming up next on NJN, the Nightly Business Report. A summary of the day's buying, selling, trading, and international commodities analysis. For a thorough and enterprising business update, stay tuned. <laughs>